at this rehearsal. Um, good. Now you should be seeing my presentation, hopefully. Yep, we can. Oh, great. So I wrote this module. It's a gold profiler. It helps you make your scripts faster. And that's only because just watching all Matthias's sessions on PowerShell performance and then just staring at my code and trying to figure out why it's slow didn't really turn out to be a viable approach. So you might have seen me presenting about this before on PowerShell 24 hour, or maybe it was uh, the BridgeConf. I don't really remember. And that was mostly a concept and it was just very, very convoluted to get it working. And I spent most of the time explaining how it works internally and how you build and edit PowerShell and so on. Well, not anymore. Now you can install it just directly from uh, PS Gallery and there are no external dependencies and it has like free commandlets. So it's super simple to run. So you should definitely give it a try. So what you see here is a screenshot of me running through a profiler. The command is trace script and I'm running Pester's own tests because that's a great way of exercising a software that you write tests for it and then you profile those tests. And where's my laser pointer? Here, this glyph, that's where all the pester output would go, but that wouldn't fit on the screen. But you can see that we got almost 3 million trace events that Profiler was able to collect from that run. And we spent maybe two seconds profiling them. So not only Profiler is really good at profiling your code, it's also pretty fast. I optimized it so this doesn't take two minutes anymore. It only takes two seconds. And then we see that the whole run took one minute and eight seconds. I will explain what this A means later. And you can also see that it tells you exactly which variable you used to save this result. If you didn't save it, well, nothing is lost. It will give you a warning and it will tell you how to retrieve the whole trace. It's get dash latest trace. And so this is what you will then see. Uh, I'm looking at trace top 50 cell duration and I'm using format table here. Uh, we're working on making this the default, but you would have to do pipe into format table in your code as well. All of those properties, you don't have to specify. I'm only specifying them to be able to fit the stuff on the slide. You just make your window pretty wide and it will fit by itself automatically. And so there are a few yellow dots. I added those in an editor and those mark lines of code in Pester that are slow, that I just found to be slow by running Profiler once over that instead of spending a month trying to figure out the performance. I was able to remove those lines because I don't actually need to be running most of them every time. I can figure out the path to my test drive once and then just save it. And so this is the result. This is how it ran before. That's 18 seconds for run or eight seconds after optimizations. And if I run it the second time, it runs 12 seconds or two and a half seconds. So pretty much uh, cutting the performance in half just by spending five or maybe 10 minutes on fixing my code and profiling it through Profiler. And it's not just me who is having some success with this. So for example, Guido here picked up Profiler early and he already aced it at his customer site, taking one script from 11 minutes to about one minute. So if that doesn't motivate you, then I don't know why, just showing off in front of your friends that you can make your scripts really fast. Um, so I would start now by going into your console and just saying install module profiler and install it into your session so you don't forget. And you can try it tomorrow, you can try it in three days. It's definitely a skill that you will use in at least the next month, because performance is always talked about, especially if you have something that boggles you, like a script that you don't know why it's so slow, just run it through Profiler. I will show you how. If you want to share some feedback, then go to github.com slash nohvnd slash profiler. So now hopefully while you are installing Profiler into your session or making a note to do it tomorrow, we can look at what you will see in this talk. So I will have some performance considerations. 
then I will show you how to profile your code. There are just two commandlets that you need to know, trace script and invoke script. And we will also look at flags, which is a feature of profiler. There are also some patterns that you can use to improve your code, like uh, not using uh, plus equals to add to an array. This talk doesn't really focus on that, but I will, be I will be showing multiple patterns as well, but it won't be exhaustive. I won't spend any time on how Profiler works internally. Well, maybe one minute. And then I will show you how I took the core of Profiler and used it in Pester to get a new code coverage, which is way, way, way faster than the previous one. So first, some context. My naive approach to PowerShell performance. As I said, I already watched all videos from IS Retet Me from Matthias, and they are a great source of uh, the basic practice, like don't use plus equals here, maybe pipelines are slow and so on. And his PS profiler, which was a great inspiration for this tool is also great, but it has some serious limitations. So instead of improving that, I had to uh, come up with my own tool. So to tell you a story, maybe two years ago when I was working on Pester 5, I wanted it to be faster and I wanted it to be faster than Pester 4. So I spent a month maybe trying to work on the performance and my approach was this. Look at the code, try finding stuff that's slow, avoid all the basic stuff like plus equals or pipelines in your code. I already did that. And so I pretty much just aimlessly scrolled through the few, uh, few thousand lines that the module has trying to find something that just looks slow. If you find something that looks slow, then try to guess how many times it might be running in your typical run. So sometimes it may run once at the start when you're doing some setup. Sometimes it might run for every test maybe. And sometimes it might run multiple times for a test, maybe tens or hundreds. So I was trying to guess that, how many times that would run. Then I was trying to guess how much time I could save by optimizing this by 10%. And if that looked like a significant amount, I started looking for changing, how could I change the code? So let's see an example. Now you should be able to see my code. So this is something that you might see inside of Pester. Uh, we have some collection of objects that represent tests and each test just has a name and it has a tag, which is a string. I have 5,000 of them. So that would be like a typical Pester run for me. Only the first two have some tags, which are windows. And so then I have this function, which is called filter test. I just give it a test, check if it has the same tag. And if it does, I will return it pretty much like a where, but the real function is actually way more complicated than this. So I run this and why don't we have any output? Good. So I run this, it gives me two tests and it takes 107 milliseconds. So in the context of what I said before, I would start guessing how many times this would run in a given pester run, because that's what I was optimizing. And I know that this would run just once because we are filtering the tests only once. So the maximum amount of time I could save is 107 milliseconds. And it's also not very usual to have 5,000 tests. Maybe you have less. So for me, I had to decide if this is worth optimizing. And I thought, yeah, maybe, maybe if I could take it down to half, then having 10 functions like that would, instead of taking a second, it would take half a second. So I was thinking about the solution and uh, the solution here, instead of calling it uh, once inside of for each for every test is just to take the whole array and put it inside of the function. So we avoid this function call because it turns out that function calls in PowerShell are super slow. And that's how my code would be changed. Very simple refactoring, which was another factor for me to actually optimize it because the refactoring was just so simple. So the same test here, again, we have 5,000 of them. And now instead of running inside of for each, I have this for each inside of the function. 
this is not a great naming convention, but I just want to show that there are multiple tests passed, passed in. And now I run it and it takes four milliseconds. If I try to run it multiple times, it will get down to two because some of the stuff will get pre-compiled and so on. So we almost saved 100%, maybe uh, 98, right? And so this was maybe worth a lot, but until I found this point in the code where I could do this optimization and I'm still saving just 100 milliseconds, don't mind it. Um, it took me maybe two hours to just find this place, which is pretty bad because then it took me like five minutes to actually fix the code. So it turns out that there are actually three problems to be solved. Which code is slow? Which code is worth optimizing? And how do you optimize it? And each of this point has a different difficulty. The first two are more difficult than the last one, even though it doesn't seem like it. Because the first two, if you take your script and it has 10,000 lines of code and you just slam it into forum and you say, hey, this is slow, how do I optimize it? Nobody is going to jump in and help you unless you pay them for it. But if you get 20 lines of code and you slam them into forum or you post them on Twitter, there is definitely someone from the PowerShell community who will jump in and they will explain why your code is slow. So how do I optimize it? Looks like the most difficult problem that we have, but actually the easiest one up to a point. So how do you find which code is slow? For that, in my module, I have this trace script commandlet to which you just provide a script log. And it's not because we just take script block, it's because script block is the easiest unit of code that you can pass to a different function and still execute it correctly. So for example, this is how you would call trace script, which is coming from the profiler module. And you would give it your own script with parameters and everything that you need to pre-figure out. And it would just profile this part. This part. Or you want to profile a module so just import a module and call a function from it. Or maybe you don't want to profile how much time it takes to load the module, but just this function. So just move this out of the trace script script block and you will be profiling just this part. I should probably just enable this again. So if you move this out, it won't profile it. If you keep it in, it will profile your startup performance, including call to this function. So script block is just super versatile. And you can just inline some code into it. You can run any script. You can run modules. You can run whatever. A profiler will just discover everything that you executed. And it will give you the result. Um, there was also on Twitter a lot of mentions of profiling your own profile to get like the startup performance of the console uh, much better. And this is how you can do it. You just start a new PowerShell console and then you just call trace script and just dot source the profile and it will tell you exactly what happened in your module uh, in your script in the modules that it loaded and so on so this might be a good starting point for you and then the simple humble script block with just the inline code that's what I will be using in my demos because that's the easiest way for me to show it on a single page, but it's in no way limiting for you to just do code inside of a, inside of a script block. Okay, so example number two. So here I have a very similar example to what we had before. We again have 5,000 test objects, but this time this tag is an array instead of just a single item like a string. So we need to do more checking on it. And this is how my function organically grew to be, like how I developed it, how it got more, more and more complicated. So originally I had this helper function called any which in a PowerShell 2 or whatever compatible way checks if we have any items in the array. And then I thought, oh, it would be a nicer syntax if I would have none. So I create a function called none and just negated the result of any. And then I have this filter test 
and I can check. If there are no tags, then I will just return because it pays off to simplify the logic later in that function. And if we have any tags, then we will just check if tag is inside of this collection of tags and we return the test. So just simple comparison of arrays. Again, okay, we need to import that or I need to import that because I have module autoloading disabled. But for you, probably it will be picked up automatically. And so I run profiler. I run here inside of trace clip, trace script, this script log, and it tells me that it's running in 64-bit PowerShell, what the resolution is, but this is really nice number, 100 nanoseconds, but PowerShell is really capable of running minus 50 milliseconds plus 50 milliseconds on a given run. So don't get too hang up on that. Uh, it gives me some output from my script and it finished in 866 milliseconds. We can also see that here. So this is wall clock time, how much time it took uh, based on stopwatch. This is the actual execution time taken from our trace. The distinction is not very important for you unless you have a bug, then this helps me much easier. Uh, this makes it much easier for me to see the bug. We got 700, uh, 75,000 events from this, and this is the result. So we can see that filter test is on the top because that's a expensive call. Then we have this non tag, which suggests that the none is also taking a lot of time of this execution. And then we have any. So they rank on the top of this execution. And those would be the first lines that we would start looking at. So my fixed script doesn't use any of that. I just took the code directly from none and uh, transferred it to be able to use it directly inside of the function. It makes the code a bit, bit uglier, but it will make it much, much faster. And so if we scroll down, we can now see it takes half of the time than what it did before, just, bef just because we threw out, threw out some functions. And uh, we can now see that this filter test is still taking a lot of time, but we won't focus on that. Um, but we reduced the other calls and now the runtime is half of what we had before. This obviously has a downside of the code not being as reusable and so on, but Profiler helped us to identify this problem. You also have to keep in mind that this is a canned example. So in your own code, which actually does stuff, uh, function calls might not be the biggest problem. It's probably the last part that you want to be optimizing because you are throwing away reusability of code and so on. But if you need to do that, it will be able to point it out. And so what do we have? Oh, okay, I was looking here at top 50 duration, but there's also this top 50 self duration. And I really need to explain the difference between those two. So here we are ordering by top 50 duration, because in this case, it doesn't really matter. But you can look here that the duration and the self duration is different. And the difference between duration and self duration is that duration includes the time from when you entered the function and when you left. So it includes all the code that was executed underneath inside of the function before you returned from this function. Self duration, on the other hand, is just from when you called to the function to the next event that was received. So the difference here, and it's better to show it on an example like this, where we have start sleep, If I run that, just going to, yeah, this is the first output from ordered by duration. So based on the duration, the F was the slowest thing in this script. And this just tells us, the duration just tells us which areas of the code are slow. So for example, you would have function F that would call 20 other different functions. Each of those functions would be reasonably fast, but Together in F, they would take significant time. 
So f would be from entering the f function, the duration of f would be from entering the function to leaving it. But if we look at the self duration of f, you can see that it's almost no time at all because that only accounts from entering the function to the next thing that happened inside of the function. So the next thing that happens here is start sleep. And that takes one second of duration because we entered the function and then there is nothing else that we could see inside of this function because it calls into .NET and there it just blocks the thread for one second and then it returns. So that's the duration and it's the same for the self duration of the start sleep. Um, because start sleep will enter, there is nothing else after it and then we will return after one second. So duration shows you big pieces of your code that are slow and self duration shows you the actual tiny pieces of your code that are slow. So in this case, the main culprit here is the start sleep. And if we order by self duration, we can see it ranking on the top because it takes the most own time from the whole execution. Those two views are um, complementary. So you would typically start from the self duration. You would order by top 50 self duration. You would look at the offenders on the top and you would solve those first. But then at some point you will get uh, to a situation where most of the code looks normal. It looks like it does the stuff that it should do. The times look reasonable and so on. And then you can go to top 50 duration and look for pieces that don't really belong. Like, you know, this function, because you know, the code, you know, that function is doing a uh, just little piece of work and it's taking 50% of the execution time or maybe 12, which doesn't really seem appropriate. Uh, one more thing to look at here is this percent. Those are not meant to be adding up to 100. Those are just how much time this duration takes from the whole duration. So um, in this case, this duration is 99% of the execution actually, but it's more, more like an overview to be able to judge how much you would be able to save from this line and all the code behind it if you would reduce it by 50%, for example. So yeah, so if I would be able to simplify this F function to take half of the time, I would self save half of the time on the whole execution. That's why the percent is there. Went through this example already. And so which code is slow? You just look at top 50 self duration to see which pieces of the code are the slowest. And then you can look at top 50 duration to see which bigger parts of your script will take the most time. You have to marry this with your knowledge of the actual code to like spot problems and to spot parts of the code that are taking way more than they should. So the next question was, which code is worth optimizing? And with that, you can decide based on the hit count. So I disabled that, but shouldn't do. Um, here I can see that the hit count of this, and my mouse is stuck, hit count of this is 322. And I know that there was probably 322 somethings inside of this run. It was probably the describes where I'm setting up this test path. So I know if I reduce the runtime for uh, this command, it will reduce it for every item in my execution. So if I get more tests, it will be faster. It, I, if I get less tests, it will be also faster by this amount. So you have this hit count to see how many uh, things were hit on that given line. And by that, you can judge how much time you would save or if it's worth optimizing or if it happens on every iteration in your script. It's again, dependent on what code you have, but uh, it can be a guide. For example, here you can see that I have 52,000 executions of this line, write debug message. But I know I'm disabling this in my code before, and this is just a debug run. So for me, this means, oh, I don't need to optimize this because I already did that. But how I did that, I figured out that this would be slow. And so I've wrapped all calls to this function into an if that is checking just a simple Boolean 
And so I don't have to process any of the strings that I'm passing to the debug message. I don't have to check if I'm on the correct level, which again happens here. That takes another 300,000 executions. So in the normal run where the debugging output is not enabled, I'm just checking a Boolean every time. And that's way, 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 way faster than what's happening in here. So it was another optimization, just not one that I have to consider in this. On the other hand, if I knew that I'm not running a debug run and this would show up, that would be a problem and I would be able to see it from profiler. But I'm throwing an exception every time it's not wrapped in F, so I wouldn't be able to see that, but that's just specific to my code. So to know which code is worth optimizing, just look at the percent, look at the hit count, and uh, again, marry it with your knowledge of the code. Try looking for stuff that shouldn't be running and is running or for stuff that's running too many times and that you can optimize for every loop because then you will get the benefits. How do I optimize it? The last question on my list, as I say, most of the time, if you have a, some short code, you can just ask people on Twitter. They will help you or ask your colleague or try to figure it out yourself. Um, function calls are slow. Plus equals is very well known to be slow. And uh, you can replace it with a list or outputting into a variable and so on. There are many, many guides on actually doing the optimizations once you know which code you are dealing with. But I have an example for that, and that's exactly this plus equals optimization, because it wouldn't be a talk on a performance without plus equals optimization. And so I'm running this code, and it takes two seconds to finish. We can't see your code yet. Oh, OK. So I have this code. I have the script block, which contains a uh, for each that runs 10,000 times and adds items into this array A. What happens here is that every time I do this operation, it will create a new array and it will copy all the items from the previous array to the new one and add the last one. This makes it really slow and it's slower and slower the more items you have because every time you need to copy all of them. So I trace this script and you can see that the culprit is actually this line because that's very well known and it's also reflected in profiler. You can see here that uh, the code took two seconds to run. And so that's, that's unacceptably slow. So you try to optimize it and you would probably optimize it like this, or you could create a list and you could add to it and mutate the list. And that would also be much faster than copying array every time. But this is a good optimization. We just output the item directly into A. So we don't deal with the array ourselves. We don't copy it. And everything happens automatically for us. This finished in how much? 100 milliseconds. And it was 2,000 2, milliseconds faster than the previous one. The code is acceptably slow, uh, acceptably fast, I think, right now. And so we did some optimization. But how do we know we did a good job? So that's my last question. How do I know I did a good job optimizing this? I can see it here because I only have three lines of code. But what if I have a more complex solution, like the whole pester code base? I can run it and I can see it might be running faster. I can do more optimizations and it gets slower. I can then do more optimizations and it gets faster again. So what happened? So that's why I thought how I do it. And I came up with flags. Uh, now you should be able to see my code again. And so a flag is using just the fact that uh, if statements in PowerShell are invisible pretty much to the scoping and the execution. So if you have a code that is the code that you want to optimize, you can wrap it inside of an if. And if you would have uh, a variable that would be global, that would be switching between true and a false, you would be able to switch between two different code paths in your code, which is exactly what I'm doing here. So for trace script, the commandlet that's coming from profiler, 
I have this flag parameter and it takes a hash table. The hash table has an arbitrary, uh, can contain arbitrary amount of names and you can choose the names, whatever you want. And I just happen to call this profiler underscore array just to be able to know that there won't be any conflicts with my code. And I'm saying that it will be true. This doesn't really have to be here. And this represents the after side. That's what this A here stands for, after, after optimizations. And so here I have my old code and here I have my new code. So now when I run it, this would be defined as a global variable and this path would be skipped and we would go to the else. So now I should run my fast code. Now I can go to trace script and now I can see I want to run this as before. And now it's slow again because I'm running this path. And the beauty of having if in PowerShell is that you can wrap function definitions inside of them. You can wrap a lot of stuff inside of them. So this is pretty generic solution. So if you want to just optimize a big function, you can wrap it all inside of this. And you can have as many flags as you want. So I could have like profiler two here maybe, and also say it's true. And it would set both of those variables. But why am I using hash table anyway? The reason is that now you have the option to disable some of the flags. So this was all, this always represents the after side and the before is all of those keys are set to false. So now I would be running the slow code for this path if I would have it, but the fast code for this one. So if I have conflict in between my optimizations, I can optionally disable and enable some of them to see what has the most impact, maybe decide, oh, this one is a great optimization and it doesn't break my code as much. And this one is just a marginal improvement and I don't want to have it. So I will disable it, still be satisfied with my performance. My code didn't get much uglier because I didn't inline my functions in that optimization and I can use it this way. Uh, let me just show that in practice on the first flag. So if this would be false, then I would be always running the slow code. So slow code. And if I remove this, it will run the after path, but it's still set to false. So it still runs the slow code. You also have this after parameter, which I had this before. Um, that's just doing exactly the same as not having it at all. So unless you want to disable this feature, don't set it to false, set it to true. And that will enable the code. Now, this is difficult to do manually and you have to switch back and forth and so on. So that's why you have invoke script, which does the same thing, but automatically. So yeah, this is just my rehearse. This one should be true. And I say, I want to repeat this three times. So I still have the same script log that I would give to my trace script, but now I'm giving it to invoke script. I have a first run, then it's doing second run, then it's going third run. You can even run, uh, you can specify like preheat and run it a few times before just to compare the raw performance instead of the startup performance. And you can see that in all of those three runs, I'm consistently faster with the new improvement. So my code is consistently better than the previous one. So this way I can add different uh, performance improvements, uh, get, put flags around them. And as I progress and find new, new and new uh, improvements, I can add them in like this one session. And then in the end, before I want to commit, I can decide which ones I want to keep. And because the code is contained in those ifs, I can remove some of them or I can keep all of them and just remove the ifs and the old code. It, uh, I used it for pester improvements and it was very useful to be able to do this. So I could see like this optimization is worth it and this optimization is ugly and it's not worth that much. And when I was like working on it for a week, I could disable the performance improvement that I created at the start of the week because it was just a knee jerk reaction and uh, it wasn't really worth it. 
So Invoke Script will help you to see that you are going in the right direction. You can run your script multiple times in a row. You can see that you are consistently better and uh, so on. So definitely do try this at home. And so this is just repetition of what I shown you before. So that's how you would invoke a script that would take some parameters. Uh, this is how you would profile a module. And those are probably the most useful cases that we have. So now let's jump to how Profiler actually works. Hope I still have some time. Um, so I will try to do this in like three minutes. I have like 10 different slides, but I hidden all of them. So I will just show you a single demo. You, you, you have more than, than 10 minutes. So you, you, you can take your time. Okay. Until people object, you can, uh, you can keep on going. Okay, I will just show this simple example. And if there are many questions about how it actually works, I might go back to it because the slides are not even finished that much. And I don't want to confuse you. But there are demos for all of them that you can get in this code. So showing code again. So I don't know if you are aware, but there's this set PS debug uh, commandlet in PowerShell. And it's pretty magical. You can enable it. You tell it to trace one or trace two based on the uh, verbosity that you are interested in. And it will just show you what, like, what exactly happened. So you can see that here on line two, we executed this assignment. On line four, we executed uh, this. We looked at the words, which is this variable. And then again, on line four, we look at this iterator variable and then we go inside of the array. So uh, the for each. So we go here and then we evaluate it on line five. And then because this is a loop, we went back to word because we have more words and we did this. But the problem is this only writes to the screen, which really sucks because there is some very useful info in that. So, uh, the cool thing is that there is an extensible point. So if you're writing your own host, like this terminal, you can customize or you have to provide a way to write to the screen. And in this case, write the debug output to the screen. And there is a class that you can provide, which represents your host. You can, for example, use it to specify how you prompt a user in this like a choice. So it can go up like a GUI, it can be text and so on. So if you take that and you implement it yourself and you just delegate everything except for a debug output to the actual host that exists, then you can customize what will happen when you get this debug output. And so I use that as a trigger. And then I have a bunch of reflection inside of my code that just looks at the, at the current state of the debugger and uh, the call stack and the internal state of the PowerShell engine, and I just save it. So I will just capture uh, how many items are on the call stack. I will capture which uh, script block is currently executing, and I will capture the extent, which is the text, pretty much of the code that is currently executing. And so that gives me totally the same info that I have here, but in a more programmable way. So I can also capture a timestamp when that exactly happened. And then I can use this long list of items to calculate all of the stuff that the profiler needs to know. So yeah, if you look at this pattern, it says two, four, four, five, four, five. And if I position the code just right and I just do a trace, and I output those events, which we collect, it is totally the same thing. It's as two, four, four, five, four, five, four, five. So I'm in a clever way, pretty much just filtering the same thing that you would get from the set PS debug. And uh, then I can do some post processing on it. There is quite a lot of stuff that is making this unique, but let's not dwell into that. It was more than three minutes, I think. Um, so the cool thing about profiler and pester code coverage is that they are pretty similar. 
So profiling cares about all the code that you run. It cares about which code exactly you run. It doesn't care about the code that you didn't run, but it cares about how many times you run your code and how fast it was. Code coverage, on the other hand, you will provide files that you are interested in uh, knowing the coverage of. So it cares about the selected code that runs. It cares in those files which code runs, but it also cares about which code didn't run because that would give you the uncovered code in your tests that you need to cover with tests. And then it doesn't care about how many times you run it, but it cares if you run it at least once. So that would be the distinction between code that run and that didn't run. And it doesn't care how fast your code was. It just doesn't have to measure it. So those are two pretty similar um, requirements. And I was able to take the core of the profiler because I was originally starting it as a solution to get faster code coverage in Pester and use that core and a custom tracer, which wouldn't output all of this information for everything. But instead, I would give it a list of items I'm interested in. And when I hit them, I just flip a Boolean flag and just say, yeah, this was hit. And that's my difference between the code that was run and that wasn't run. So in the end, when I all of this have wired up, then I get to this performance, which uh, is between the old code coverage in Pester, which uses breakpoints, which are extremely slow, and uh, the new code coverage, which is using Profiler. And so what happens here, what you can see on the graph, if you have little code, maybe like a few thousand lines, it's not that different. But if you take that code and you copy it and you make the code base five times faster, then instrumenting the code and processing it makes it way, 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 way slower with the breakpoints. That's because if you have multiple breakpoints in PowerShell, they will get copied every time on every line into new array. So we are back to this plus equals problem that I described at the start, but inside of the PowerShell engine. And if you make the code 10 times bigger, it gets even worse. It's not even linear, it's quadratic. And so the performance from the new profiler is just amazing compared to that. And those 12 seconds, those are on a first run, just to be fair to both of them. If you run this the second time, this will still take 290 seconds. This will take five. So it gets optimized down because a lot of the stuff will get compiled. Um, so if you haven't already, yeah, those are actually the screenshots. So you know I'm not lying when you're looking at those slides. Um, if you haven't already, go and download Pester 5.3.0. There are still some bugs in the code coverage that need to be solved, but it's an amazing step forward to me. And you can just disable the old one by using this dot use breakpoints and set it to false. And if you go to this link, which is release notes for the previous release of Pester 5.3.0, there is a whole gist where I describe how to set this up, how to create a comparison between the two XMLs. So you can show me if there are any differences and also how to report failures and so on. So that's the new code coverage in Passer, which is based on the profiler and it's just amazingly fast. And so if you haven't already, then go and install profiler it's just install module profiler in your console. If you are interested in this and you work with it and you find something that's weird or doesn't work, then share feedback on my GitHub account. And you can also follow me or ping me on Twitter at nohbnd. Uh, my DMs are open. So if you have questions, just shoot them my way. And yeah, that's it for my presentation. I think I did it on time almost. So questions, please. Cool. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll give people the opportunity to unmute themselves. Let's see if that uh, if that goes well. Uh, so that quick, quick question, because uh, what I noticed when I was working with Pastor is that whenever I, I put breakpoint in the code and I don't even use code coverage, the tests become really sluggish. Uh, would that also help with this uh, issue? 
you weren't using code coverage and it got much slower if you have yeah so 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 i I would just put break for myself to like for example to verify what happens why my mock is not working right so Mm -hmm. i put the breakpoint somewhere in my test script i run it and it goes super slow okay there can Um, be two reasons for that uh one is if you are debugging the script and are you using VS Code? So no, if, no, no. Okay, so that first uh, goes out of the window. That would be if you would press the debug button in VS Code, it actually starts outputting all of the debug stuff and checking all the debug stuff. So Pester itself got gets uh, much slower, the execution, because we check all the right debug stuff and so on for the diagnostic output that actually helps you. Um, describe what happened during the execution. The other thing is if you set a breakpoint, then PowerShell debugger, internal debugger will start running. So that could be another source of the slowness. Um, but then the last re- last option would be that you have just so many breakpoints, which you probably didn't have. So yeah, honestly, I don't know why that exactly happened. But if you have a repro, we can just look at it. If you put it on an issue on GitHub. Okay. Well, uh, my question is more, is, can I expect that uh, the fact that you are not using the debug in the profiler, uh, sorry, in the in the coverage, so coverage if, will help? If, if you are getting slowness from just setting two breakpoints, then that might be problem with the execution in your editor. If, it's hap- if it happens for you, every in, like in every console on that system, then it might be based on the system. Or if you can reproduce it everywhere, then it might be a problem for us. But for us, we need to have at least one breakpoint uh, set because if you disable all breakpoints, then PowerShell internally will also disable debugger and set PS debug depends on debugger. And even if you have set PS debug enabled, it uh, will just disable it. So we are keeping one breakpoint set during the run. So the debugger is actually running. So yeah, normally it shouldn't be slow for you if you enable breakpoint. If you have less than 100 breakpoints, it shouldn't be very noticeable that you are running under a debugger. Are there more questions? Uh, There were some questions in the chat about some failed installation issues, but we managed to resolve it before uh, before your session ended. That's cool. Uh, well, actually, one question, uh, more of the fun question. How do I convince my manager to allow me to spend a day to optimize code that runs three seconds faster? How do you do it? Um, you have to optimize better. That, that's, that's, that, that's the answer. You know, just find a better thing to, to optimize. If three seconds a day won't save you enough time. You have to find a script that takes half an hour and uh, then be sure to optimize it to one minute or something like that. Or just tell them it's your learning time and do it on your learning time. That's how I would do it. Anyone has any other suggestion? (laughs) My my suggestion was just to... uh overestimate the time you spend on other tasks to uh, to get the time okay that's also possible that's that's even better solution oh uh, well if uh, no one else has any questions uh, do follow uh, do fo- follow Jacob uh, on Twitter uh, if you find something in pest that doesn't work, make an issue because uh, I mean it's it, is it officially your job now to maintain pester or is it still a side project that you uh, do in your own time no it's not my project at all my uh official job is actually uh supporting the testing platform that's running under visual studio so I'm not sure if any one of you used it but if you start visual studio and you press display button inside of the test window that's what I support Cool. So it's I, a still a side project, both of those. It's definitely a side project that I use on a daily basis. So thanks for that. <laughs>